Okay. So, so hopefully at this point, it's obvious that, you know, we've got small numbers. We're more than happy to return to topics as needed throughout the day um, and try and dive in a little bit deeper on specific interests along the way as well. So what we're going to do now is we're going to cruise on in, hopefully to our lab downstairs. I think we're going to start off in the SEM with Zach Michaels and um, Zach, Dan, and Mark, as you go around, if you could introduce yourself when you, you start giving a tour, that would be awesome. Oops. And I need to do things. How? I think it's yep. done. Great. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. I'm just trying to get your video up. Do you want me to yeah. pin pin your face or do you have another camera? I have another camera, this one, uh, that I'm gonna show some things with, but um, okay. I'll try this for a second. Uh, all right. All right, I'm gonna- I'm Zach Michaels. I'm the new SCM lab manager here, uh, working in the LaserCron facility. You can see behind me uh, is the lab. I'm going to walk around with this camera so you can see some things in more detail. I have another uh, version of myself logged in here that'll just kind of show the room that you can maybe see too. Hey, Zach, give us one second. We're not sure. live on the right format. So, no worries. Hopefully. Any ideas? Anyone who's better at Zoom? I did pin it. He is pinned. Oh. Yeah. Hold on. Show all windows. Do I need to change something, maybe? No. Top share. There we go. Okay. All right, Zach, you're up. Sorry about that. Great. No worries. Okay. Hello. So I'm Zach. This is the SCM lab uh, at the LaserCron facility. And uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a tour. I'll switch from my face to the front camera so you can see things here in a minute. Uh, but this is the room where we do all of the imaging characterization for the samples that come through. So I'm going to highlight a couple of the details about what kind of characterization we do and how that helps with the actual um, laser cron operation. So I'm gonna switch here, all right? So first of all, this is Tristan Nolan. He's a undergraduate in the department who helps out. He's actually been working in this lab longer than I have. I just started in July. This is our scanning electron microscope that we use for um, all of our imaging here, for at least for electron imaging. It's a Hitachi S3400N variable pressure microscope. And what that means is that we can operate it under either full vacuum or a partial vacuum, which is nice if we don't wanna have to coat samples or we have samples that um, we wanna run in, in, dip for, in different conditions. Um, it has a very large chamber. So even though most of the things that we run for the ALC have, are small um, mounts that, that are not very big, we can put very large rocks in here if we want to image those too. It is a tungsten filament source, which means it's sort of like a light bulb in a way. We run a really high current through the tungsten filament and that generates the electrons that are then accelerated down through the column to interact with the sample in the chamber. We have a couple of specialized detectors that allow us to do more than just image these samples or image them in different ways, I guess I should say. Um, one of the things that uh, you'll see in a second here and then you'll probably benefit the most from as an ALC researcher is our cathode luminescence detector. And it's actually inserted right now um, doing some mapping. So right now you can see live we're mapping some samples. And one really nice thing about this detector is in addition to the uh, color CL imaging that we can do, which I'm kind of highlighting here, it also will simultaneously take a secondary electron image from the 
microscope and it has its own backscatter electron image. So we can simultaneously capture three different kinds of images at each spot. And what, what we're doing right now is rastering around a sample to collect a bunch of images to make a montage, something like you see here. So this is from an igneous zircon mount uh, where we stitched together a bunch of CL images to show the internal um, chemistry trace element distributions that help us have a better sense of what we're analyzing when we actually zap these on the laser in the ALC. Um, I wanted to highlight too really quick that the other uh, main kind of imaging that we do for samples is backscatter. And uh, the difference between, or, or I should say the, the usefulness of backscatter electron imaging is that it highlights different uh, Z contrast in your, in your material. So basically different composition, but in a grayscale sense. So on the left here, I have an image that was the whole, um, the entire epoxy mount of this sample where then we went in and, and took closer images for the CL. And these were all zircons. So you don't really see much of any difference. They all look kind of the same grayscale. Uh, but over here, we have a mount from some detrital grains and you can, hopefully you can see that there's some differences in grayscale here. There are bright grains, which we've, uh, we've contrasted everything to match the, the standards that were on this mount so that they look bright. And then there's darker grains in here that are not zircons. And so that's really useful um, and helps us be efficient when we're analyzing these on the lasers to know exactly what uh, we should target. The other main, the, the two other main detectors that we use that are um, additional to this machine are an energy dispersive spectroscopy detector, uh, EDS, and an electron backscatter diffraction detector, EBSD. And the EDS detector is used for measuring the energies of characteristic X-rays that are generated through uh, electron interactions with the sample. And that allows us to map, um, actually map out chemistry in an X-ray way. So instead of just grayscale, we can make, we can actually generate spectra for every point in a map and make maps or point analyses. The electron backscatter diffraction or EBSD unit is for mapping the crystallographic orientation of minerals. And that's something that I'm particularly interested in my research. We don't use a whole lot for ALC operations, but we, we do have it here in case you wanna use it. Um, and so if you ever come to visit, uh, we have, uh, we've, we've set up some nice monitors, monitors so you can so you, um, show everybody sure what you're doing while you're doing it. Or if you have a group in here during non-COVID times, it can be kind of grouply interactive. And uh, uh, over here we have some uh, of our prep area where we'll prep samples. So let's see, the other things to see are we have our carbon coder here and our workstation. So here's where we do some image analysis and stitching and where we upload everything to the Google Drive to share with other uh, ALC folks and with um, researchers that visit. So that's, uh, that's the, pretty much the whole lab. Um, if you're ever here to visit, um, you'll meet me and we can uh, work on things together. It is also a, a major uh, goal of ours to get everybody trained to use this equipment. So, you know, if you are comfortable or want to learn uh, when you're here, we can work on getting everybody trained so that you can actually do the imaging yourself if you want. Obviously, I'm here to help or Tristan or anyone else to do that for you, but um, it's, it's a goal of ours to make sure everybody gets acquainted and understands what the machines do and how it works for, um, for collecting the data that you need. And we're, we're definitely excited to help train you too. So. Um, I think that's about all I was hoping to cover. Are there questions that people have about um, what we do here and, and how it supports your research? Zach, maybe I missed it, but could you go back over uh, the electron beam again and, and basically what these images, how we're taking them and, and yeah, basically the basics of how an SEM works? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so I don't have any slides to show you at the moment, but... Um, the idea is that the uh, electrons are generated up here where the filament is. 
And then there are some electromagnets that focus the beam and accelerate the electrons down into the chamber. And at the chamber, then they'll interact with, um, we'll have things mounted in a little holder like this. And the, oops, I think I unmuted my. Sorry about that. And the differences uh, between our main imaging techniques are we either have what's called secondary electron um, interactions, which the electrons, when they hit the surface of the sample, are more effective. The signal that we get back, those particular kinds of electrons are coming out of the surface topography. So if we have any bumps in your sample, you have actually, you get brighter spots where there's hills and valleys. So it's really useful for imaging the surfaces of, of materials. And then for backscatter, we actually get an, an uh, elastic scattering inside the material so that the, the electrons that come back to the detectors are telling us more about the dense, the atomic density of the material that we're scanning. So that's how we can qualitatively um, get, a, get images that tell us about the qualitative uh, compositional differences in the sample. So for example, for the detrital sample, I showed how we get a, a brighter, um, the brighter signals are from higher density materials and darker signals are, are less. And so it's not, it's not the same as using something like um, the EDS or if you're familiar with uh, microprobe analyses, it's not as quantitative as those, but it is still quite useful and it's quite fast so that we can take an image, you know, we can take a sample and map it in a matter of, uh, sometimes depending on the size of the sample, 15, 20 minutes and get a nice coverage of, of all the grains and amount and use that to guide as a map for analyses that we do in, in the lasers. Awesome. Do you guys have any questions? I'm more than happy to relay them to Zach or you can come on up. Come on up. So, um, hi, Zach. Uh, the, uh, I have a question about the, the utility of CL versus alternative methods that give you more quantitative compositional information. Obviously, the CL zoning images are really nice contrast between zones, but you don't know that much about what the, what's actually creating the zones in terms of the, the elemental composition. And um, I've heard that some uh, labs are using things like Raman and, and other methods to get uh, more more quantitative information do you have any comments on on that i mean obviously eds would be a very time consuming and so it's not very efficient but um just any comments on on the utility of different methods for getting the, the zoning and, and compositional information definitely no that's a great point and and we um so you're right the eds is is a more time consuming effort um, the, and as you mentioned, the CL is, is useful, but again, like similar to the backscatter, it's, it's qualitative in a sense that we don't necessarily know what each of the bright spots are. Um, people have done a lot of work on zircon to, to, to think about how those different um, brighter and darker areas are correlating with the chemistry, but there's a lot of overlap there too. And so you're, you're absolutely right that the CL is it's sort of the, it's a first step in a way at this, at least with the equipment that we currently have. Uh, right after, so I just started here on July 1st. And right after that, um, I wrote a proposal with George and Mauricio um, for an instrument upgrade that includes a new Ramon spectroscopy system. And so we are really looking forward to, and we're optimistic about that proposal, but we're looking forward to um, incorporating that where, you know, we're able to do uh, spect spectroscopic, more quantitative chemical analyses that are faster than both our EDS and CL detectors, but are complementary in the kinds of things that we expect to see inside the zircons or other, other phases. Um, and so we, uh, yes, I, I really like your comment because, you know, what we're doing here is, um, was maybe sort of state of the art a decade ago and has been, you know, we've been updating and staying, staying current as much as we can and, and keeping these things going as far as characterizing the samples that come through. But we're looking forward now to really taking the next step to using newer methods that are, that are now even more efficient and more quantitative. So um, 
I think your, your point was kind of that these are not very quantitative in the things that we mainly use. And what we're hoping to offer if we get this new system is um, the ability to have your samples mapped, say in with Raman spectroscopy instead, or in addition to any of these other methods. And then, um, you know, we can, one of the things I'm particularly excited about is the, because of all the throughput that we have here, is the kind of ways that we can actually, um, as, a, as a facility, start to weigh in on, on relating these chemical differences, or not differences, but the things that we see from these different uh, methods to one another, and sort of maybe calibrating even more what we think it is we're seeing in CL um, and, and vice versa with the Raman system too. I'll add that the, the proposal we wrote for the upgrades includes a proposal for a new EDS system that is actually notably faster where we can do, we can actually move around the sample and, and see the chemistry mapping live. So it's a, it's a almost an order of magnitude faster throughput for the EDS detector and software um, and an upgrade for the EBSD system. So um, it's maybe not as, as much of interest to some of the folks in this group, but um, it currently, or I should say, if we get that system, we'll be able to map a few orders of magnitude faster in crystallographic orientation and phase. So we can use that in uh, simultaneous with EDS detection if we, if we have that new system. And uh, that might be really helpful in cases, you know, where we want to supplement something like CL or backscatter with a more quantitative um, analysis of your samples. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Are there any other questions? Thank you. That was a great question. Yes. Hi. Um, I had a question. When we come in with a detrital zircon sample, um, do we do the CL imaging for, for, we don't do it for every grain, right? So how do we choose which grains and should I do that like beforehand? So for the detrital samples, you know, what, uh, let me find an example to show you. Um, we'll have a sample. Well, in general, I guess, even though this isn't a detrital sample, we'll have a, a, a bunch of grains like in a square of a sort of square made of sand or something that you pour out from a given sample and we have mounted in epoxy. And then we actually will, um, for at least for backscatter, image all the grains in that in that sample. So um, if I still, oh, let me see if I still have it open on my desk. Here. So uh, I zoomed in here, but here we, we mapped the whole, uh, these were a few different samples on single mount, along with some uh, standards. So I zoomed in just to show where some of that contrast is, but we'll map this, um, and it'll maybe take, depending on the size of the, the mount and how many samples are on there, we'll make a montage so we can map at different scales and you can request a different uh, resolution scale if you want. But the idea is we'll take an image and threshold it as best as possible to really reveal the whole range of backscatter contrast that we can get and basically map every grain that's that's in that separate that we mounted. Gotcha. So, okay. Um, then cool. from there though, we you know what is sort of optional or I encourage people to to opt in for um, CL images as well, and we can do those for for detrital mounts. I think you just get you know it's it's useful to have the backscatter absolutely, but to have the CL images really gives you uh, a, a whole other level of intragranular information about each grain. Um, it takes longer, and it uh, but it's I if I was if I was submitting samples, I would definitely have both of them done. Um, but we, we do basically do it for any of the grains that you want done in the mount. And for backscatter, we typically are doing it in most cases for all of them. And so that would it be something where like, I mean, cause for, so if, if you do decide to do the CL imaging it at that point, are you choosing which grains to, to focus on? Um, you would or tell them which, which sample. So usually it's like a cluster of grains. If you had just okay. a specific grain or something, absolutely. We can do that. And we can, um, you know, there's a balance between the amount of time we spend and how much resolution of information you want from each grain. 
And so in some cases, people maybe only have a, a handful of grains, um, even if you know that's more likely from igneous uh, samples that they've picked. But if there were things you wanted a, a publication ready, super high resolution of a couple grains, that takes a little longer because we'll map it at higher resolution and have a longer dwell time per pixel, but we're, we're absolutely ready to do that. Um, for something like a detrital mount where we have you know, hundreds of grains and a, a bigger area on the mount, um, we, we sort of balance between, we make sure that we can see the intragranular things we, we need to and, uh, or, or that we expect to, and then set that to mount and, or to map and that'll map basically every grain in that mount. So those are kind of our two ways that we're operating are either covering an area, um, which is the more typical thing we're doing and then mapping every grain in that area or um, targeting specific grains or specific regions of, of samples and mapping those. Cool, okay, awesome, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Maybe I'll just jump in with a little bit more information. This is George here. What you need to be careful of is to not bias your sample by selecting only grains that have a particular appearance in CL. What you'd wanna do is analyze every grain in, a, in an area that looks like it's good enough to analyze high enough quality. But then the power of the CL image is that it allows you to choose where in each of those grains you wanna put your spot. And what you don't wanna do is put a spot right on a boundary between half of the spot would be in bright CL material and half would be in dark because then you're probably overlapping different age zones. So then the power of CL is that it's really gonna improve the quality of your data because you can decide where in that grain you wanna put your spot. Great point. Anything else imaging related that we wanna ask Zach? All right, that was awesome. Thank you, Zach. Uh, Mark, Thanks are you a lot, going? everyone. Oh, it looks like you have a question in the chat, Zach. Maybe you can uh, answer it on there. Sure, sorry, I wasn't watching the chat. Let me see here. Yeah, the question is about grain size. How small can you go? Yeah, so right, it says, what size of grains can we image? Well, I, I think typically a lot of the grains we're seeing are on the scale of tens to a couple hundred microns in, in diameter, maybe a, larger than that sometimes. We can go uh, notably lower, um, but the resolution in general for imaging of our tungsten filament machine is, uh, you know, sub-micron, but it's not quite as good as something like a field emission uh, source where you have a, a really, you know, you're down sub-nanometer in that case for the resolution. Um, the, so in that sense, the, the limitation is, the, is the, the small, you know, the smallness of grains where you start, you start to have not as great of imaging and your spot size starts to get um, at a scale where you're not getting quite the metrology that you want. You're not resolving all the features that you want. But um, for most of the zircons that I've worked with here so far, that has not been an issue at all. You know, if we, if we have a grain that's um, five or 10 microns across, we can still really zoom in and get a, get a fair amount of detail out of that image. We also, um, I've been recalibrating the system here to use a lot lower accelerating voltage. And one of the things that's useful about that, especially if we want more detail or have something smaller is that the, the, the lower accelerating voltage, and that really just means how fast are we throwing the electrons at the sample surface. Um, the lower that is, the, the less interaction volume there is for, uh, for the electrons that are coming out and being detected. And so if we use something like 5 uh, kV instead of 10 or 15 that we're kind of using more standardly, the interaction volume is small enough that you start to resolve even smaller scale features. And so we can start to see um, more numerous small uh, differences in CL or in backscatter too. Um, it sometimes, depending on the sample and the response or signal we're getting out of it, that may increase how long we have to dwell at each spot to get the signal that we want, but it's, it's very doable and it can increase the, the resolution. So there's a bit of trade-off in signal versus resolution sometimes, but um, I, haven't, I haven't, I should say, I guess to really answer the question, I haven't tried to look at what the smallest grain we've, we can map here is, but I had a 
student from, so one of the other things is this lab helps support a bunch of student research on campus and in the department that isn't just um, supporting the ALC. And so I had a student come in from the, uh, a microbiology student come in and was looking at bacteria a couple of days, or a couple of weeks ago. And those were on the scale of about a micron in diameter. And we were able to see some of them. You know, they were a little bit fuzzy um, and we had to operate in variable pressure, which means that we didn't have as, as good a resolution, but we were able to resolve them with some, some nice, uh, with extensive kind of focusing efforts. Um, and so I, depending on, do you have a sense maybe in the chat um, what the size is you're thinking about? And I can at least tell you if, if that's an issue or not. I think maybe the question is also about analyzing. The, we're comfortable analyzing zircons down to about 10 microns. We do that pretty routinely. Uh, when you get below that, though, then the precision and accuracy starts to fall off. When you go to a, an, a laser beam of uh, four to six microns, we just don't have great precision and accuracy. But, but I, think, I think routinely, we're good down to about 10 microns. OK. Yeah, that's a great point that uh, the imaging is maybe gonna, our spot size for imaging is going to be different than the actual uh, analysis spot size for the lasers. So the chat says perhaps ranging from 20 to less than a micron. So 20 should be no problem, um, especially from an imaging standpoint. But it sounds like for the lasers, then you're starting to get it. You know, if you were at 10 or less, you may uh, not be able to resolve the information that you want from it. Um, I'm, I'm confident we could still get uh, decent images from a 10 micron grain. If you're down below a micron, we're even the imaging, um, we're going to struggle with this machine to get uh, a lot of detail out of it. Uh, but there are, that's not to say, you know, in general, I've been talking about the scanning electron microscope sort of generally, but there are other machines that are used um, that have different electron sources and electromagnet optics. Um, typically, these are all field emission guns instead of a filament-based source. And those allow for sub-nanometer um, resolution in, in imaging. Again, though, those grains, that doesn't change the fact that on the laser, you're still limited by, by this grain size. So that's a great question and a great point about as far as things coming through that, that are going to be analyzed, what, uh, what is sort of the limitation? So it sounds like from George, we're, we're thinking about 10 and is where you, you want to be cautious. Awesome. Thank you so much, Zach. That was great. Mark, yeah, can we hop over to the new lab? You bet. Can you hear me uh, fine? We can hear you just fine. Don't see you yet. Oh. But that might be my fault. Yeah, my video started. I could see me. Hey, I see George. <laughs> I see George as well, but I, right. I can see in this. There we are. We got you, Mark. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, welcome to Tucson and uh, and and the the Laser Cron Lab. And I thought that uh, we'd start here in the hallway. And the reason that I wanted to start here in the hallway is just because there's a, a you know a, a ton of effort that goes between when you collect your rock in the field and when you actually get to uh, come in the lab and actually run it and get data. And so uh, when your visit would start here, um, typically we're gonna meet here in the hallway or right outside the lab. And first thing we're gonna do is, is sort of look at, at some posters um, that are hung up in the hallway and sort of talk, um, talk, talk about some strategies. You know, all, a lot of this conversation will have happened already, um, but once you're here and, and just getting, getting everybody's uh, mindset to make sure that we can answer all your questions properly, we're gonna go through um, different things talking about um, how to set up for hypernew and, and Kurt's uh, Kurt's uh, poster would do that. And and there's other things uh, in the hallway that we we will certainly discuss when you're here. But I did want to focus on this picture because that's a photograph of what the lab typically looks like. However, this is what it looks like right now um, because of COVID. And the big thing you're gonna see is there's nobody in here but me, so I can take my mask off. And uh, what's happened is uh, with COVID, we've had the transition 
to uh, remote sessions. So mo most of the sessions we're running right now, while COVID is, is, is still in one of its peaks, um, we do remote sessions where we set up a, a Zoom session or a, a team viewer session with researchers um, and, and then collect the data that way. And they, they can still participate in, the, in a session. Right now, what we're doing actually, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna first jump right into the data because this, this run is about to finish and I wanna show you um, acquisition, uh, real-time acquisition of some data. And then, then we'll sort of talk about the instruments. Here I am, uh, this is where you would normally be sitting operating the mass spec. There'd be four or five people probably uh, in here working with you, trying to figure out uh, you know, the best, best thing to do. And uh, the, the laser is the, the one right there, the black one, and then the mass spec is all in white. And your control center here um, consists of control for the laser. And that's what you see right here. Right now, what we're doing is we're running hafnium analyses on zircons, and uh, I'm just standardizing. So uh, running through a bunch of different large standards using a 40 micron spot. And so right now we're uh, in backgrounds and that's why the laser is not firing. And now we uh, just started ablating the crystal. And as we're ablating on the mass spec side, we set up in time resolved analysis uh, where we're continuously integrating um, for uranium lead, uh, we integrate at, at uh, 0.1 or 0.2 seconds and for hafnium either one second or two second. Uh, right now it's set up for a two second integration and that's what you see right now. Uh, the plot as the laser is firing, it's being filled and uh, we're counting all the ions for all these different collectors. Um, and then once, I don't know if you can hear the laser ticking, but once the laser stops ticking, um, you'll see that uh, there's a really quick washout. And, and that's one thing I wanted to point out here is uh, right here we're in background and then the laser fires and we're instantly seeing a signal from the mass spec. And so now the laser's still firing. It's about to stop any minute or any second. It just stopped and that quick, we're already washing out. We're, the signal is washed out and we're back down to backgrounds. And so this is a cycle that we're doing when we're doing time resolved analysis. So uh, this acquisition is about to finish up. That's why I wanted to jump in there really quick just to show you. Um, what, I, what I'd like to do is, is go back a little bit. I know you've talked a little bit about the, the ALC and, and uh, what we're about, but there's one plot in, in specific that I'd like to sort of focus on. And it talks about the different labs and, and the different analyses. And so um, what you can see right here is uh, along the x-axis here is a year from 2005 to 2020. And on this axis, it's the number of analyses per year. And on this axis, the number of publications per year. And as you can see, the start of the facility started in July about 2005. And uh, for the next few years, we used a uh, multi-collector called the isoprobe. Um, and then this particular instrument that you're going to see came in in 2009. And so it came right here. And, uh, and th this is really where, uh, you know, the, we jumped up in the number of analyses and also the number of publications per year that are coming out of the lab. And, and so this instrument, the new, has really been the workhorse uh, of the lab from 2009 to at least 2015 when the E2 came into service. But even when the E2 came into service, we continued uh, with this instrument, just doing slightly different things. And now, now that we're doing hyper, uh, hyper new, we're doing a lot more uh, uranium lead on this instrument again. And so I'm envisioning that the next plot after COVID, that th th these, these uh, histograms jump up uh, again, just like they did here when we put in a new, a new instrument. And then the, the bottom line is, uh, you know, and, and, and the goal for you to come here is to collect your data, but to publish your data. And so we're gonna do everything we can that when you leave, that you leave with publishable plots and all the tools, all the methods, uh, you know, where to find the methods and, uh, and help you get to publication because this red line is the publications per year coming out of the lab. And right now we're about 130, 140 publications per year. And I think we could do better than that, uh, but that's about every 3.4 days, there's a publication coming out of the lab. All right. so. Um, now let's just jump into the instruments. Let's talk about sort of what's going on. Because the bottom line is we want to get uh, from a rock 
to some sort of, I'm gonna put a glove on real quick. Just so I could handle the, the samples. So by the time you are, are in this lab, your sample is, is no longer in the form of a, a rock. You have specific mineral uh, zircons or, or monazite or apatite, whatever you're, you're running, already mounted in a one inch round. And so what we do is we take this, this one inch round and we um, put it in a chamber like this where we have nine different uh, holes and then we put it inside the laser. And so, so this is our eczema laser. It's a Photon Machines G2 uh, eczema laser. It operates at 193 nanometers uh, wavelength. So that's the UV spectrum. And the, the beauty of this laser is uh, really in this little box right here. This is the helix cell. And I'm hoping that what you can see is there's an arm that goes into the cell. And then uh, the, the, that tray with the sample holder sits inside. It goes in from the side where those handles are on the side. And inside there, there's uh, this mechanism. This is at the end of the arm. And inside it, there's unidirectional jets that create a Venturi. And what that does is it helps us um, efficiently pick up the sample. So helium is our carrier gas. And I'm hoping that you can hear it ablating right now. But the, the, so the, the laser beam goes through this cup with the helium flowing. And the beauty is there's not much fractionation across the laser cell because the geometry between the laser beam, the cell and the gas flows and what's being ablated really does not change no matter where you're at in the cell. So uh, selecting a lab, you, you wanna have something to where you have a dual volume cell. Um, and then when you go to the E2 lab, Dan's gonna show you the next version uh, of, a, of an eczema laser uh, with this type of cell. So. Uh, this, this is my, my best friend here in the lab, because when it's operating um, very well, it's, it's amazing. And uh, when it's, uh, the, the previous version had a, it had a laminar gas flow, very inefficient at picking up the sample. And so once we got this, this, this was a game changer for us as far as, as, far as precision and accuracy, it really, uh, really helped out. But what happens is uh, you ablate the material, the analyte is carried in helium through this tube, and then uh, this really fine tube is called an aeros uh, tube, and it's a, a rapid aerosol delivery system. Uh, the old tubes used to look like this, big uh, fat gummy tubes, and were very slow at transporting the sample down. This aeros system is very, um, very fast at sample delivery. So once again, those peaks look so sharp on the beginning and the end because of this tube. And so we'd never be able to do hyper new routines without, without that tube. And then uh, the tube goes into the, the mass spec. And if you could see in there, that little green glow, that's where the magic happens. That's, uh, that's the plasma. It's uh, at about 6,000 degrees Kelvin. And, uh, and, and that's where an, uh, an electron is stripped off and you create a positively charged ion. Um, and then it enters the vacuum. So right here, there's an interface. Uh, First, this is, this is what the, the plasma torch looks like. It's a, a, a glass torch with an inner volume and an outer volume, and it's an argon plasma. And then after the sample's analyzed, the beam actually goes through a sample cone uh, with a small little hole, if you can see that there, and then it goes through a skimmer cone. And then after that, it, so right here in the extraction housing, um, it's 10 to the minus four, uh, tor 10 to the minus seven tore through the, the transfer lens stack and then down through the flight tube. And so in, inside here, we spend a lot of time tuning the instrument, uh, basically changing the voltage across different plates to focus the ion beam. So it's a nice focus beam once it goes to the end. And then there's uh, what are called vertical and horizontal defining slits that, uh, that allow just a, a small sampling of the beam uh, and what we want to enter the flight tube. And then uh, the flight tube, here's an electrostatic analyzer that filters out part of the signal that we don't want. And then all mass specs have a magnet. And then uh, this instrument has some quad lenses. Uh, and then this is the collector block. We have 12 Faraday collectors. Faraday collectors are good at measuring a large signal and they're very stable. And then we have, uh, so 12 of those, and then we have four ion counters. And this part of the instrument uh, 
this is an ion gauge is at 10 to the minus eight to 10 to the minus nine um, tor. So, so a, a pretty high vacuum. Uh, back to the collector block though. So uh, when we're doing a uranium lead measurement, we're measuring on the high side Faraday's uranium 238, thorium 232, and then on the low side Faraday's lead 208, lead 207, lead 206. And then uh, the ion counters, we put uh, lead 204 and there's isobaric interference from mercury that comes from the helium gas, carrier gas, uh, that we measure mercury uh, 202 and then uh, subtract, uh, subtract out the interference. So th th this is uh, what, what you'll see. And, and I like to start with this instrument because it's real easy to sort of see the, the layout and talk about what's going on. Um, Normally, I, I talk about sort of how, how the magnet works. And, and uh, you know, I, I always like to think of the magnet. That, that's how we um, figure out or, or set what, what we want uh, the collectors to measure. Because we do every, all the measurements are in static mode. The collectors do not move. Uh, we change a magnet set point. So I always think of the magnet as like a crosswind. So you have this part, uh, positively charged particle coming through the flight tube and then being dispersed by the magnet. I, I, the analogy for the magnet would be like a crosswind. And then if you have a baseball and a ping pong ball and you throw it into a constant crosswind, the magnet, they're gonna deflect at different amounts. So the baseball is only gonna deflect a little bit. And that's what happens to, with like uranium or thorium. It just gets deflected a little bit and it's measured on this side of the collector block. Lead, even though it's heavy, it's a lot lighter than, than uh, uranium. When you throw that through, uh, through the constant crosswind, it gets deflected a lot more. And so that's why we measure uh, those down here on this end. And then there's a whole bunch of different um, optics to, to allow us to get, uh, and steering mechanisms to allow us to get the beam into the ion counters. For, for hafnium, uh, we only use the Faraday's. Um, for uh, uranium lead, we use both the Faraday's and the, the ion counters. So I'm gonna just go back over, over here. Uh, it looks like we're still not finished here on this one. so. Um, I'm just going to let it run, but eventually, once this, this runs, what we're going to do is we're going to take the data over to um, our reduction computers and start reducing it. And so this is some hafnium data. Uh, mostly uh, what you're looking at are standards uh, where uh, we plot the, the standards, the, the values that we've collected, this, uh, this measurement are all in here and the different standards are all in different colors. So R33, Tamora, you know, SL, you, those, those names don't mean anything at this point, but when you're here, they certainly will. And then we plot them up to make sure we're doing okay and look at the errors. Like right now, uh, the instrument's running, running awesome. It's uh, 1.7 in the fifth place precision. So that's uh, just over half of an epsilon unit at one sigma. So uh, th things are going well and, and uh, happy to, happy when things are going well because we have lots of lots of maintenance coming up and uh, we want to make sure that everything goes well for that so we're, we're doing some upgrades on this instrument uh two weeks ago we had the engineers here and and they did some additional upgrades increase the sensitivity hence why everything's just beautiful right now um but looking forward when when uh when you all bring your samples here and and uh looking forward to working with you Happy to answer any questions. Just, just throw them out. Uh, happy to walk back through any instrumentation that we you want to look at. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. So Mark is the guy to ask any technical questions to. He knows every bit of these mass specs inside and out. So if anyone has any tech questions, Mark's your guy. George, it looks like we had something come in on the chat. Would you mind reading that out? Yeah, so the question is, how often do you have to clean the cones? Yes, oh, let me minimize that real quick. Uh, so typically, uh, I like to change the cones once a week or maybe once every two weeks, at least on, on, on the new. Um, you know, typically what happens is, as soon as we start to see any, any signal sensitivity start to drop, um, we'll, we'll go ahead and at least change them. I, I usually have three different sets that we rotate through and they last for a year and a half or so. And then we, then they're out of service and onto the new one. So they probably run for a week 
maybe eight to 10 times throughout the year, maybe a little bit more than that, 15 times, and then it's time to retire them and, and move on to the next set or next set of three that we rotate through. On the E2, it's a little different. Our, our element two, the engineers from Thermo, uh, don't, don't like us getting in to change the cones nearly as often. Um, I still think it's, it's required. And as soon as you start to see any signal sensitivity uh, drop off, that that's probably one of the, the quickest culprits uh, to try to solve that issue. You're welcome. We've got one more question, Mark. Um, so I actually, I actually have two questions. I'm not sure if, if you want to answer both or not, but the, the, the easier one is, is the, the mapping, uh, the, the process of actually automating the, 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 uh, the ablation spots. Um, so you come in with your backscatter image kind of connecting to what we just talked about with Zach. Uh, you come in with your image and, and are you plotting those out in advance? Because obviously you're not, you're, you're, you're analyzing material right behind us, but you're not doing a lot of uh, hunting and pecking. So what, how, how does that work? And then second thing, if you, if you have a little time to uh, elaborate on the Venturi and the, the, uh, the collection of the ablated, ga of the ablated um, material from the sample um, and, and what makes this instrument uh, uh, unique and, and um, uh, what's the advantage of the, the little cup that the, that the um, photon machines laser has? Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, both great questions. And, and the funny thing is you, uh, you are only seeing the part that we're running. You did not see the preparation that, that went into it. Uh, and, and when we're running uh, with images, we pull those images up on the, on the laser computer we import uh, backscatter images or CL images, take the time to, uh, to make them match as best as possible the, the actual mosaic image from the laser. And, and then we carefully pick spots. I, I personally like to do it on two separate computers. I pull up my image on the one and then I'm, I'm going quickly on the other. But a lot of researchers like to overlay them and just toggle between opacity so you can look through your, your CLs or look through your backscatter to, to pick your, your grains that way. Every, every sample is different and, uh, and we can customize to whatever you're looking to do. Um, but, but yeah, there's a lot of preparation that goes into uh, being able to sit here and, and enjoy the fruits of the labor and watch, watch the data come off the mass spec. So um, it, it's fun either way, whatever, whatever you're doing. Um, but, but lots of preparation. And then the Venturi, uh, you know, from our experience, uh, prior, to, um, prior to going to the G2 with the, with the Helix cell and, and the Venturi cup, our signal on a, on a Sri Lankan Zircon was about 100 millivolts, maybe 120 millivolts uh, of uranium-238. And instantly when we went to uh, the new laser uh, with the Helix cell, it, it, it was clear that it was so much more efficient at picking up the sample. It, it, it went to at least three to 400 millivolts. Um, right now, the sensitivity is higher. I'm running at about 600 millivolts on a, on a SL crystal, uh, 700 millivolts, but uh, it, it instantly uh, increased the data. And then, and then looking at, at plots, uh, we make these sorts of plots all the time. Hang on just a second. Sorry, somebody was trying to come in. Um, and uh, we make these sorts of plots and, and George referred to them earlier. These are our standard plots. And what they are is they, they list all the different standards that we run in round robin fashion from 28 MA to 3.4 GA and everything in between. And then we compare, these are all very well calibrated via ID tins and the ID tins value would be represented for each one with this black line in the center. And then what we do is we run round robins where we, we uh, we go through, do an analysis of each one, and then do it again and do it again and keep going until, uh, until we're finished, usually 10, 10 or so analyses per sample. And then we plot it up and, and we compare it how we're, we're gonna do here. And when we went to the new laser with the, the Helix uh, cell, uh, the, da the data certainly were better as well. So uh, we started seeing uh, better accuracy and, uh, and, and the error bars were, were much uh, smaller as well. So. Uh, Mass specs uh, love a lot of signal. You know, they're great at measuring ratios, 
they're, they rarely get the correct ratio. Uh, so that's why we do the sam sample standard bracketing um, and, and calibrate uh, the data that way. But, but going to this uh, Helix cell was definitely a, a positive increase in, in data quality. I hope that answered your question. Anyone else? Maybe I'll just jump in and, and, and offer a little bit more information about spot selection. That, you, that usually happens offline and uh, researchers can do it from wherever they are. We'll send you the image. You're able to access the Chromium software from Teledyne, put that onto your machine and you can do all that spot selection the week before you come to the lab. So it's best if all of your spots are selected on those CL images before you ever get here and it makes your visit so much more efficient. And we've really developed that in COVID times for obvious reasons, so. Okay, awesome, thank you so much, Mark. Um, do we have Dan online? Yeah, I'm here, can you guys hear me? We can hear you, we still see Mark. Yeah. Now you just see me. Now I see you. Okay. Pin you. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Alberts. I work in the E2 lab, which is our uh, secondary mass spec. Well, not secondary. It's one of our primaries, just like what Mark had mentioned. Um, and it came in around. I forget what Mark said when we got this instrument, but. Instead of looking at me, this is our element two lab. And just like Mark said, I'm the only one in here right now. When we have visitors, we can have five, six people in here. We have tons of monitors for uh, offline targeting uh, and our laser. And so Mark had just gone through our uh, G2 laser. We have one in here. It is uh, currently down, but luckily we have uh, worked with Teledyne to get a brand new laser and help them develop that along. And that's what we are currently running. Uh, this laser in front of us here is the Teledyne Iridia that has a vastly different chamber and sample uptake than what Mark just described with the helix cell. Uh, moving on over is the element two itself. Uh, right now, you can see some of the guts in there. We were having some uh, cooling issues with our chilled water, but we are back up and running now. Um, and here is our torch box. And also one thing that's vastly different from the new, um, the new you can see the entire flight path. And here we are all boxed up. Everything is inside. Uh, what is inside is all of this. So it's a little bit simpler than the new, um, but same principle. We have our ICP, um, our plasma generation and our torches here. And then we go to our interface region, which has our skimmer valve and uh, our skimmer valve, our, uh, our cones, our skimmer cone and sample cone. And then we go to uh, lens and optics, which kind of refine our beam. And then it goes through a low resolution slit. And then we enter our magnet, exactly like how the new works. And then our uh, ESA, which is where our collector is, um, is in the back. And this instrument, unlike the new, is a single collector. So we are using an SEM detector or a uh, secondary electron multiplier. And the secondary electron multiplier works on the, the basis of an ion comes in. After the magnet, it hits a conversion dynode, which is just a little piece of steel. It generates an electron. And then through our collector, it creates a cascading effect and the computer counts it. Uh, this instrument is very good at uh, resolving lower signal and very, very high signal. Um, unlike the new that you would need to switch to ion counters uh, or um, Faraday cups, this one just has our single uh, collector on our SEM. I am currently running right now. I couldn't really hear Mark's laser going and I don't know if you can hear this laser going because it's significantly uh, quieter. But if we come to our control panel, you can see a bit uh, of the laser action itself. Right here is the, uh, the home screen of the Iridia. And you can see I have several spots targeted. These are all zircons here. There's a non-zircon here that's just really crummy. The laser is ablating and you can see that flashing. 
on our zircon. And then if we go over to our mass spec computer, we can see our live signal coming on. So unlike over on the new where they run TRA, we run each individual grain and then we do our math from there. And so you can see our signal has come up. The green is uranium 238. That's a bit choppy of a signal, but it's okay. It's going pretty good. And uh, yeah, this instrument can is capped by uh, the amount of rows that we can do or how, how many iterations we can count. And so we can only run 397 spots over here. That capability is expanding um, uh, uh, currently. Uh, the main use of this instrument is uranium lead on zircon, uh, mainly detrital zircons, but igneous ones come through here all the time. We are expanding those capabilities to do uh, trace elements of several accessory minerals. We do them um, trace element runs for zircon, apatite, um, titanite, and monazite currently. Uh, another awesome thing that this laser can do, which is referencing back to um, uh, SEM work and how we can visualize uh, and quantitate the, the trace element distribution is that this laser has the capability coupled with some software that uh, Teledyne has given us to do high precision and fully quantitative elemental mapping of your grains. So currently on the laser, we're just doing individual spots, but with that mapping that this laser can do, we can go down to, I believe a five micron spot and raster across an entire grain, throw some standards in there before and after, and we can give you fully quantitative picture of your grain. Um, that takes time, but it will be very, very powerful for, for not just zircons, but monazites or put a garnet in there and you can see uh, the distribution of several elements. Um, we have yet to get that up and running, but that capability is, is right on the horizon. And one other thing I wanted to mention is you guys had some questions about how do you pick your spots? And so right now I'm picking some spots for our current visitor that's running because he is out of town. Um, and so this is, would be very similar to how you would do it at home. Oops, sorry that my hands are shaking here. I'm using my phone. Um, but you would download Chromium. We would take these images here that you can see. Um, this is a mosaic from our laser. We'll send you those files. We'll send you a generic scan list, which already has unknown spots and standard spots uh, labeled for you. And it's as simple as just dragging and dropping a spot onto your grain. And then you save it and send it over to us and we run it for you. But this is a, a great way to keep researchers engaged while not in the lab. We would love everyone back, but of course COVID is uh, capping that. Also, I'll just show you our very most recent run on this instrument. So Kurt has a program to the MATLAB script for use in the E2. We were Excel based, um, but with updates and Excel being a little clunky, we transitioned to uh, MATLAB based reduction. And here you can see our standards over the entire run. Uh, it's looking real tight. Our standard errors are 1.05% and 0.89% respectively. Uh, you can also see the um, on peak signal here looking real nice and our distribution of standards uh, throughout the run and their age offset and the corrections that we do that Sarah did mention. Um, other than that, uh, Mark hit on a lot of the technical things. A lot of the uh, principles of the new apply to the E2 as well. Um, so yeah, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, yeah. Awesome, thank you, Dan. I want to highlight two things really quickly, and then I'll let you guys ask questions to Dan. The first one is something that they both touched on, which is that the mass spec and the lasers are not built to communicate with each other, which is just wild, right? So you buy a laser, you buy a mass spec, and it becomes Dan's job to make them communicate, right, Dan? Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes that works really well and easily, and more often than not, it's kind of a hard, arduous process. So that's what we're going through with this new laser. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize is the big difference between the mass specs. So the first mass spec that we saw 
It's called a multi collector. You're, you have really stable signal. It's good for high precision measurements, things like uranium lead or lutetium hafnium, which we'll talk about this afternoon. The, uh, the mass spec that we just saw with Dan, this is a single collector. It's rapidly scanning across all the masses. It measures uranium, lead, thorium, um, and then any trace elements that we're interested in. And then it does it again and again. Um, this is what we use for trace elements. This is how we collect 23 trace elements plus uranium lead ages all at once because we have such fast electronics. Okay, any questions for Dan? Kurt? How fast does that happen? Oh, I don't remember what the sweep rate is. Uh, milliseconds. I think it's 150. 150 milliseconds that the magnet can scan from or jump from really low. So lithium seven all the way up to uranium 238. So it's incredibly fast at measuring really low uh, weights and then really high, high weight um, elements. Any questions for Dan before we uh, say goodbye to our Tucson folks? <laughs> How do we keep track of the samples versus unknowns in that kind of cloud of zircons that, that we showed that we took pictures? Dan, could you hear that question? Uh, yeah, but so uh, how to how do we keep them organized essentially from spots on standards and spots for our unknowns? So if I go back to that uh, computer where I was picking some spots. Within here, when we send you scan lists, everything will be labeled already for you besides, uh, of course, your sample name and like um, any, anything specific to your samples in general. Uh, so it'll pull up in a short list like this. And um, just like what George had mentioned, um, when ratios aren't coming in nice, we do sample bracketing. And we have this whole scan list already set up for you. So we have our standard names, primary and the E2 lab is FC. And then we do five unknowns, another standard, SL is our secondary in here, and so on and so forth. And um, everything is labeled for you. So down here, you can see I have a cluster of SL crystals here. And they all are labeled with, a, with an SL tag. And so just being cognizant of where you're placing it um, is the easiest way to just keep them, keep them organized here. And when we mount samples for you, we mount everything in a more or less standard way uh, where we place our standards. R33 will almost always be at top, FC's under there, and this helps us orientate um, the mount inside of the laser as well. So it's easier for you to overlay CLs and BSEs um, live on the laser. And also we keep it easier for you um, when you are picking offline, because we'll send you backscatter or the CL images, and then this third image of, a, of the mosaic that's in the laser. Um, and so keeping everything right side up with R33 helps our process along the line as well. Did that answer your question? Yep, I think we're good. Dan, I'm going to go ahead and stop us there because we're running a bit behind, so we don't want to cut into lunch too much. So we're going to say goodbye to you guys in Tucson and hand it over to Wei for uranium lead applications. Thank you guys. Awesome, see you guys, have a good time. Bye.